Howdy, howdy, everyone. Welcome to the I Read It For The Plot podcast. I am so excited for this week's episode, but before we begin, I'd like to thank everyone listening for joining us today. And if you could please like, follow, and share this podcast, leave a comment in the comment section below. And if you have a review or a book suggestion, I can talk, book suggestion or opinion you'd like to share, join us in the I Read It For The Plot uh, Discord. We have a whole selection of channels from trope talks to classic literature and poetry, smut, and even fan fiction. And speaking of smut, I have a very special guest with me here today. He's the voice of Tamlin from the Akatar audiobooks, Henry Kramer, everyone! Hi there, how you doing? How you doing? <laughs> how you doing? <laughs> Sorry, I when I get overly sarcastic, I do a terrible like um, Brooklyn, New Jersey accent. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. We all have our faults. When I get overly stressed, I I devolve into either a Southern British or Irish accent. <gasps> you can do an Irish accent. I can do a little bit of an Irish accent. <laughs> we have a mutual acquaintance who hates my impression of an irish accent <laughs> is it who I, do I think it, it is yes oh, and no. I, I do it just to annoy him oh. Oh. <laughs> it somehow always comes out as scottish though i end up sounding like gimli from lord of the rings uh, uh, i was actually uh, very good friends with a scotsman as well and he told me the key between an irish and a scottish accent is that an mm -hmm. irish accent is just a scottish accent that isn't angry <laughs> His that. words, not mine. I love that Be mad so at him. much. <laughs> oh, okay. We're going to get back to that later. <laughs> but um, thank you for joining me today. How is your day going so far? Uh, it's been pretty well. I, um, I got up, did my stretches, made coffee and pancakes since we're currently having a bit of a snow day here where I'm at. Oh, I'm so jealous. We don't get uh, snow we, in the area. We've had two snow days, like very heavy snow days within like a week of each other. So it's been it's been nice and cozy and we got to watch the snow fall and everything. Oh, it's been really nice. I love that. Um, but I I sent off a couple of auditions today, signed up for some comedy stuff that I'm going to be, you know, dipping my feet into, which is whole new territory for me. And Ooh. I just learned uh, as of this morning that I have been assigned to the background actors, uh, for lack of a better word, I'm part of the sag after a Union Background Actors Association. So I will be on the board to dictate rules and regulations moving forward, uh, sag after actor outreach, and helping the community as a whole. That's wonderful. I love that for you. I love that in general. Yes. It's been a very busy morning. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Okay, so Henry and dear listeners, grab a cup, grab a blanket, and let's talk books. So Henry, I'm going to start off by being completely transparent with you about something. Mm. I'm personally not an, uh, an audiobook person. But uh, but here's the thing, and I'm going to age myself here. That's mainly because the audiobooks I have tried to listen to in the past, it was back in the day when it was narrated by one voice actor who did not do character voices or accents. Harry Potter and the Order of the Phoenix, specifically. Was it on cassette or CD? I, what was it? The guy I'm thinking of, because that's the guy. No, it was I grew a woman with. Oh, I'm pretty sure oh. it was a woman. Yeah. No, no, because the the I had an uh, a rendition that was done by a guy who did all kinds of different voices. Oh, really? Yeah. So I, I'm I'm so sorry, but I, I <laughs> you just got the short end of the stick. It, I just couldn't enjoy it. You know, it's just he didn't do character accents. <sighs> he didn't do voices. To I just I pref I need the accent. You know, it's just so boring if it's not that way. But. I've heard you do Tamlin. I've heard the other um, audiobooks as well. And I think, okay, this is how it should have been from the very beginning. Even different voice actors in one audiobook. You know? It's a lot so, of fun. It, 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 it like takes a... the pressure off of you to try and come up with a million different voices, I, I gotta say. 
Speaking of which, I wanted to ask you about like your your acting career in uh, as a voice actor. Mm-hmm. Before we get uh, get into talking about your infamous Akatar character, <laughs> um, tell us about the other characters that you have voiced for other works. Which which was your greatest challenge to uh, recreate or create the voice for, and which did you have the most fun with? Ooh, that's a tough one. Um, I will say that uh, as of late, one of the harder books that I've had to do was the Rise of the Manor Lord series by Athon Books, primarily because a majority of the cast are uh, female or women. Oh. And uh, the, main char- uh, the main character is shunted into this world. He's your, your classic like Midwest slash average American guy, mm-hmm. but he comes at this whole Itsekai business as a business person, he's like, nah, you're my employees. We ain't crossing that line. Uh oh. So from the very beginning, he sets out to demolish the rules of this world, which involve blood magic slavery. Yeah. And he's like, nah, we ain't having that. And mm. he, uh, he's the only person in this world who can tell a lie. Oh, I like that. I love, I love that. Okay, so, so how is that a the, challenge for you? Because the primary cast is basically himself, a couple mm-hmm. of other ancillary antagonists, but his core, the core supporting cast are mostly women of varying ages, varying socioeconomic backgrounds, and I have to come up with a unique voice for each of them without taking away from the other feminine voices of the supporting characters, the background characters, or the uh, side characters. So I have to keep a list of like 10 to f- like 15 different female voices in my repertoire at all times. And that's hard for me because that strains my upper register. Like I'm already using my upper register as it is right now. Oh. oh hold okay. On. Now go ahead. This is my... Uh, normal resting speaking voice. This is my customer service voice that I perfected while waiting tables in D.C. <laughs> it cuts through all the base of the of, of the surrounding area. I love that. Someone, Plus, as somebody who works in customer service, I recognize that voice. Mm. Plus, yeah. it's a lot. It's a lot more fun to have a little five foot six man go, "Hi, folks. How are you?" Instead of, "Hello. How can I take your order today?" <laughs> If I did that nine times out of ten, all the dates with the guy would stand up going, bro, you want to fight? Like, please, no, (laughs) sir, I'm just trying to get money. (laughs) I love that. Okay, so what is the character you had the most fun with? Oh, absolutely. A character I've had the most fun with was from the Shadowcroft Academy for Dungeon Cores because half the characters are references to famous, like, there is an ogre uh, called Ronald Crucible, named after a very famous mustachioed character from a certain show set in Pawnee, Indiana. So I had to watch several episodes of that show to get the voice right. So I go, now, son, what are you doing? <laughs> okay. I, I, I absolutely love that. Can you give uh, us um, can you give us a line besides that one that, that you just did? Uh, in that character or one of my favorite characters of that show? Both. Okay. <clears throat> armor is a waste of time because armor just protects you, whereas a sword can crush someone. I like that line. That, yeah. <laughs> uh, this is one of my... Uh, uh, this is the su- one of the supporting characters for... Um, the main character, Logan Murray, is mm-hmm. a guy turned into a mushroom. Uh, he's a fungaloid. He's a fun guy who's a fun guy. I approve this pun. And uh, one of his best friends is a prince turned into a satyr car- called Marco Lascarellis. And he's a bit of a California surfer dude. Hey, my favorite mushroom guy. It's the fun guy who's a fun guy. We ain't okay. never gonna we ain't never gonna go down. We're spore life. Dude, I'm from California. We do not all sound like that. That is LA. That is that is that I was section. To- I was told that they wanted LA surfer bro. Did I get it, it right? That? Why is it always that for California? 
most of the people in my hometown have country accents. Oh, I'm well aware. It's it's very <laughs> like I've I've seen like I have several friends who live in California and it's mostly rural and like a strip of coast and then the mm-hmm. rest is like surprisingly very much like insular country. Mhm. Yep. But no, they they specifically said they wanted a party bro, surfer bro from the West Coast. That sounds like someone who's actually never been to California. I can neither confirm nor deny since I was just <laughs> hired by the company. Please don't oh, no, no, no. The people trouble. requesting, the people that were requesting it, they sounded like they'd never been to California. Your words, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Further on into your acting career, uh, what is one of your favorite character lines that you've ever spoken? Ooh. Recently, this past December, I was in a production of Little Women. I was both Friedrich Baer and oh. John Brooke. Oh. And my absolute favorite line that I did was by was from Friedrich. Because it actually relates to me and my partner. Oh. Friedrich says, I know wife is not a word you will ever be comfortable with, but I cannot imagine my life without you, Joe. My heart! <laughs> oh, okay. That, that, was, that was beautiful. That was absolutely yeah. beautiful. Oh, and, gosh. Uh, every time I said that line uh, on stage, I always thought of my partner when I said it and I I always got a bit of an aww from the audience. Every, everyone loved my Friedrich. He was so warm and cuddly. You did the accent really well. Thank you. Uh, I had the luxury of studying with a German accent coach for the show uh, oh. who is a personal friend of the director. But mm-hmm. I also have had a leg up in that I have an uncle who teaches German at a, he's a professor in college. And he very early on in my career uh, taught me some basic how to sound German but speak English. Hmm. So nice. you, you never know where you're going to pick up or where you're going to learn something new that you can incorporate and bring to the table. Mm-hmm. That being said, uh, what kind of characters do you like playing the most? Uh, whether it be a... Uh, a uh, manipulative asshat fay, or the main love interest, or a plucky mushroom with a can-do attitude. <laughs> I got that one from your website. <laughs> yes, I was hoping because I was like, you know what? Let's let's just include the grand scope of like the <laughs> the absolute extremes of what I can do. Um, my bread and butter that I I normally do that I find easiest to do are the 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 heartfelt heroes the guys with a, a burning desire to do the right thing and to rise above the challenges mm-hmm. but the shit i have fun with are the villains and assholes yes. because they have they have the wheely voices the conniving oh my lord you don't want to listen to them they're ruffians outsiders <laughs> they only want to bring ruin and destruction to your glorious empire <laughs> No comment. (laughs) But I've recently started dipping my toe into the fantasy romance genre, and I gotta say, playing the romantic interest or, like, the male POV is quite fun. Yeah? Yeah. It's... I had no idea that I would like it as much as I have, and there I've got a couple projects that I'm working on right now that are very adorable and also, at the same time, very terrifying. How do you delve into a character's psyche like that to prepare yourself for their voice or to create their voice? Uh, well, first, I would ask the author you know, uh, a series of questions, uh, mainly, what is the regional accent or the dialect from? Like, what is the general setting that you want? And then mm-hmm. when I further delve into that, I go, okay, where in this country were they raised? Were they in the, a cold northern, uh, a, mid- um, a mid-Mediterranean kind of all weather, a more hot, humid, like, southern climate? 
Mm-hmm. Are what is their socioeconomic political background? Are they uh, military? Are they noble? Are they merchant? Are they commoner? Are they urchin? All of these take into account how someone might have been raised and which further delve into what shaped their voice. Then we get into body type, age, you know, what's their general health look like? Are they strong, robust, or are they weak but still used to be strong, or are they frail and decrepit? Um, and it, it, I typically have a consultation with most of my authors who choose uh, the package that goes into the custom voices. And we sit down for a good hour or so and we hammer out, you know, like, hey, how many voices do you want specific? Do you have like, OK, this is one, two or three or is it, is it just like the one that's important and the rest I can just make up on the spot? There you go. So now we're going to delve into the whiny, immature, manipulative, um, <laughs> yeah. The non-therapy having ass motherfucker. <laughs> um, so you've done a lot. Uh, how did you first hear about Akatar? I was lucky enough to be working, to have been working with graphic audio for some time. Mm -hmm. Uh, And uh, Colleen Delaney, who was in charge of the project at the time, I believe it's Mm -hmm. been shifted over to someone else, um, sent an email saying, hey, um, you're in our roster and we have an audition for you. And Mm -hmm. uh, they sent me the sample script and I was slated. uh, I sent in, you know, a general like, hey, this is my voice. These are my ranges. And... They eventually came back and said, hey, we want you to audition for these two specific characters. Was it for both Tamlin and Reese? Uh, Reese Sand was a, a, a late third, but oh. it was Tamlin and Lucian. <gasps> yes. So oh, I, I, I was almost our favorite summer, summer prince adjunct. Oh, I liked... Ch- okay. Immediately, those are my favorite characters, the comic relief, sarcastic best friend characters. Immediately when I started reading Lucian's character, I was like, oh, I like this guy. Tamlin, he's, oh, he can go oh, away. Just keep Lucian. <laughs> oh, no. Lu- Lucian is, Lucian is bebe. Lucian must be protected at all costs. Yes. He, he, him, him's a sweet boy. He's a yes, very he good is. boy. Please don't hurt him. I just love how he, characters like him always have the best dialogue. They're sassy. Yeah. So how did you create Tamlin's voice? I was I, I was honestly uh, recording my audition at the end of a day. Um, mm-hmm. And I had already been recording a couple other audiobooks at the time. And so my voice was um, like my, my range was not like, oh, I can usually hit my high notes here. And the, but my upper register was exhausted. So I went into, OK, he's military. Mm hmm. But he's noble, mm-hmm. but he's gruff. Mm-hmm. Let's see where we go. Oh, fuck. <laughs> and me being tired meant that I actually used my normal voice for that. <laughs> and it ended up working. <laughs> of course, uh, Colleen and I fine-tuned it, but that, but my initial, like, Hi there, my name is Tamlin. Get the fuck out of my way. Yeah, that sounds like him. <laughs> yep. And All right. like the the fact that I didn't have to really do much for him, I was like, oh, sweet bonus. It just came naturally. Mm-hmm. Okay, so Tamlin is such a complex character, one that we readers love to psychoanalyze. Mm. Yeah. Ugh, I've gotten into so many. Um, so many discussions with fellow readers and friends about how immature he really is, um, how he never got the chance to really explore or cultivate the good parts of himself because he lived in such a very toxic environment for so long and how his protector mode is really just a a self-defense mechanism as well, you know? And, but in regards to like the theme of the podcast, which is like romance and smut and all that, how would you describe the romanticized idea of his relationship to Feyre? Would you even really call what they had love? 
that's a good one. Um, I hate saying um. I would okay. say, personally, that what Tamlin felt he could easily have misconstrued as love, but at the same time, there's also the fact that he had all of this external pressure on himself to fix a curse that was brought about because he wouldn't reciprocate someone else. So because he had all of this pressure on him and all of this focus to get the job done, which, as his background as a soldier, you're trained to do one thing and one thing only, and that's get the job done by any means necessary. Mm -hmm. He could easily have been misconstrued a, a, a either lust, which he certainly had, or his duty could have been warped into love. But I would say that, at least for him, it could have been love. I haven't thought about what Feyre's POV could be, but I do know that between the two of them, both of them had similar issues where when presented with outside stressors, mm -hmm. instead of seeking help or solace, they would retract and isolate. And neither was overly communicative. So while it is certainly possible that they could have been in love at some point, the stresses of how they responded to stress, along with the general rules of society that had been beaten into Tamlin versus what Pharaoh was looking for did not add to the relationship. No. If anything, it just made it even more toxic. It's, it's one of those things where, and this is something I like to tell people, we never get to see Tamlin whole. We only ever know him as the broken prince. Mm -hmm. He's already been traumatized by war and murder. His whole family was killed. He was mm -hmm. not raised to be a noble. He was not raised to have social etiquette or understand the rules and intricacies of running a house. He was bred to be a soldier, a general. He's good at fighting fights and, you know, the uh, taking care of immediate problems. But long-term thinking, plotting, planning, actually dealing with the day-to-days of the court? Nah, homie. He ain't good at that. No. I always and the way that he always uh, tries to protect Favor, but she never really needed his protection she just needed some support but he could never give her that she never she fell in love with the first person that showed her genuine kindness just outside of like one member of her family but she she grew up with toxic relationships and so she never knew how to have a healthy relationship neither one of them knew how to have a healthy relationship and i feel i always felt like they were on the same level of immaturity and if they had met at a different time if they had both had those healthy relationships then they might have worked but since they're both so toxic they just intoxicated each other yeah, it, it's it's one of those things where right people wrong time yeah exactly and to be honest i never cared for reese i know that he's technically a good guy but some of the stuff he does is just downright creepy he he himself is a skeevy broken motherfucker and yes it just so happens that his damage helps Feyre more than tamlin's damage all of them mm -hmm. need therapy mind you Yes, and I am still waiting for that episode. <laughs> uh, me, me, like, look, I'm over here in the background going, send Tamlin to therapy, give him a chance, please. <laughs> I want more lines, god damn it. But going back to another question, um, how would you define love or romantic love? Just in general? Or yeah. in story. Like you're well both. Like uh okay, uh, real life love versus uh fictional love. How would you define it? What we often see in fictional love is 
burning desire, a, mm -hmm. a possessive nature, or willing to sacrifice anyone and anything for the thing or the person that you care for or desire. But I've found that those that or at least that essence of love burns out quickly. It's it's almost performative from what I found. Granted, other people may say differently, and I'm not saying that your definition of love is wrong, but what I have found about love is love is service. Love is a choice. Love is being presented all these options and distractions and choosing again and again to stick to the person that you want to see succeed. To put their hopes and dreams and desires not above your own, but on a level with your own. To acknowledge that you're not perfect, and you're going to get things wrong, but you're willing to try, willing to change, willing to be better in ways you never thought. That's beautiful. I love that. And personally, I have yet to experience that kind of love in my life. And that's how I always imagined it would be. But I guess I won't know until I actually experience it. <laughs> if it helps, mm -hmm. I didn't find that love in someone else until I was willing to give that kind of love to myself. Mm. I spent years, look like the song says, looking for love in all the wrong places because... I always thought it had to come from something else, and I never thought that I was worthy of that kind of love from myself. I only thought I could ever give or receive that love to slash from someone else. But when I started acknowledging and putting my own needs in a manner of which I wished someone would treat me like, that's when I found it. Because you don't find love. It finds you. Hmm. Well, I guess I'm, uh, I don't know how to respond to that. I'm just going to just absorb that. <laughs> hey, you'll get there. I know. Yeah. It. Yeah. All right. Get, so I got one. very deep here yeah. on the no, audio. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> but I do have one last question about your your acting career. So, okay. What is a a kind of character that you have not played yet, but you would very much like to? In terms of characters, uh since I do audiobook like are, are you talking on stage or audiobooks or in general, as an actor. Mm. Yeah. As an actor, I have had the f uh, fortune to play a lot of supporting characters, both good, benign, and villainous. Mm -hmm. I would really love the opportunity to play either a main hero or a main villain. Ooh. One of the extremes. I haven't gotten there yet, but I would very much like to do that. What's your idea of a main villain, like, dastardly? I would say something akin to Iago from Othello. That's a villain. That's a See, skeevy but... motherfucker that you can't help but hate. <laughs> See, would you... Okay, I'm going to show my age here. I am a Shakespearean, but when you said Iago, I immediately thought of the parrot from Aladdin. <laughs> I, to be fair, I would also love to play Iago the parrot from Aladdin, because that sassy motherfucker, yes. Yes. Oh, my God. But no, I I that, I that completely agree with you. Iago from Othello, he's a sociopath. Oh, my God. He got problems. 
Just a wee bit. Have you ever seen the Kenneth Branagh version? No, I have not. Dude! He plays Iago. He, you, he plays dude. Iago? Yes. Mm. He, and Kenneth Branagh is always the main star of the show in every single movie. That's, even I, in, the man, even can, in the, the man can character. walk into a room, say one line, and you're like, who the fuck is that? <laughs> yeah, he's, oh, he does a brilliant job with that version, and uh, you'll recognize the main guy that plays, um, I forget his name, but I'm pretty sure he's the, the guy that plays Othello is um, the guy from The Matrix. Lawrence oh, I'm I'm pretty sure. Yes. Yeah. Oh, Kenneth Branagh does amazing casting with his movies. We're going totally off book here, but you know what? It's Kenneth Branagh. So F he, fuck it, we ball. Fuck it. Yes, and he is technically um, he he's the ultimate Shakespearean, and Shakespeare is technically a romance writer. So here we go. <laughs> hey, I mean, hey, he is the, uh, Romeo and Juliet. I'm oh. sorry. What? No, no, no. Fuck that. Much okay. ado about nothing. Mmm. Yes. Oh, Kate, that... my dainty Kate, my darling. Oh no, that's a. Uh, no, 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 that, that's. No, no, that's a. Uh, yeah, that one's about domestic abuse. So no. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, much ado about nothing is the one where it's like a. Um, Though she a, be a, little, a, she is fierce. Uh nope, that's bits of no, no, God damn it! <laughs> what? No, God, my brain. Oh God. <laughs> No, no, no. Much Ado um, About Nothing is one where it's like a rom-com soap opera where they're trying to pair each other up. Mm. Ben Benedict and Beatrice. Those are the only two characters he has ever written as equals to each other. Uh, Those two, like, come... Like, my and brain. I'm sorry, like, so many of Shakespeare's, like, rom-coms and, rom and romances just bleed together for me because I had to learn them all in college, and now I'm like, oh, God, what was that one again? Uh... Much ado uh, is my I'm favorite. I'm ashamed. I'm, I, I must throw myself from the high room <laughs> on the tallest tower. <laughs> what is the Shakespearean character you would play? Oh, in a heartbeat? Mackers. Mm -hmm. Macbeth? I would fucking love to play Mackers. Yep. Yes. Oh my I've, god. I've technically already played him once, but it was for a spoof play where, where I actually met my fiancé. The show was called Thanksgiving at Macbeth's. It was kind of like uh, 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 a dinner, a reality television show about mm -hmm. all these different tragic Shakespearean characters. Mm -hmm. It was for a fringe festival show in DC, and the show was being written while we were learning the script. Oh my god, I love that. Yep. So I did a couple of Shakespeare classes for college, and one of our assignments was we had to create so a little skit that was um, Shakespeare themed. And one of the examples that our teacher gave us was a video that a bunch of her classmates made where it's a bunch of Shakespearean characters uh, gathering together for a house party. And it's like Hamlet, uh, Romeo and Juliet, Othello, all the oh, works. No. <laughs> Hamlet is just, he's the mopey, introverted, like weird character, like monologuing to the side. And here's the thing, here's the thing. And I freaking loved this. All the other characters are in the living room watching The Lion King. And it's a scene where uh, Simba's like talking to his father in the sky. And Hamlet's in the kitchen. He's reciting Simba's lines. And that's when I go, oh. That's when I realize I, I'm as old as this movie. This movie is my, is my age. And that's when I realize that The Lion King is based on Hamlet. And the entire class starts laughing their asses off at me. <laughs> oh my god. Uh, to be fair, I I didn't know that The Lion King was based off of Hamlet until post or like at least like late college, so I'm I'm right there with you. I get it. And uh Lion King 2 is based on Romeo and Juliet. Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of um modern remakes of Shakespeare like She's the Man is based on Twelfth Night. Um, 10 Things I Hate About You is Taming of the Shrew, which yes. actually, yes, that's a really great version. And that's actually a feminist version of that. That's the best recreation of a sh of a modern Look, Shakespeare play. It's, I'm sorry. It, it, I, I was recently shown that movie because I, I hadn't seen it until then. And it's, mm -hmm. bruh, yeah. it is one of the best tellings of that show that I've ever seen. And it doesn't involve domestic abuse. Uh, <laughs> uh, remind, apologies uh, to the Le audience. Heath Ledger was in that one, right? 
Yes, oh. very young Heath Ledger. Beautiful. My heart. Like, gone too soon. Yeah. I I still miss him. I loved I, I loved watching The Patriot because he was such a phenomenal character in that movie. Knight's Tale for me. Oh, classic. I know. That's that's such a weird funky movie. It's so much fun though. It's so stupid. I love it. Yeah. Oh god, one of my favorite Shakespeare movies of all time is much it's not well yeah, much ado about nothing with Kenneth Branagh and um my favorite actress of all time, Emma Thompson. Mm. But uh, one of my well, the one I grew up to, the one that I was raised on was the Kenneth, uh, no, not Kenneth Branagh. Um, shoot, uh, Kevin, Cl- Kevin Klein, uh, Midsummer Night's Dream with Michelle Pfeiffer. Mm, haven't seen. Yeah, it, <gasps> dude, fairies. Like, if you ever imagine the Fay Court in. In Akatar, that's like the best representation you could ever get of Fae. Because it's, uh, it's really... Really? The, yeah, but the thing is, that's like Celtic mythology in Greece. With Greek mythology. Yeah, it's like a blend of the two cultures. It's beautifully done, though. Because I- there's technically... That they had the Look, Greeks... I'm gonna have to like reach out to you after this so you can send me a list of all the shit that I've missed. <laughs> out. Look, I was literally raised on books. We didn't have cable TV in, in my house until I was like 13, 15. So all, my entire childhood, all I read was like Shakespeare and all the other classics. Mm-hmm. I was the no fear Shakespeare translator at my in my high school. Nice. Yeah, I'm like it's it's English. It's just poetry. It's what, what's to, hard, so hard to understand. I could memorize this thing so easily. I could not understand why people weren't able to read or understand it in high school. But then in college, I was like, oh, y'all motherfuckers just downloaded the Spark Notes, didn't you? <laughs> yeah. Well, technically, if they weren't raised on it, then they probably yeah. didn't. You know, or you know, some people to each their own. Some people don't like Shakespeare. Hey, you know what? That's entirely fair. You're allowed to not like classics for a reason, but mm-hmm. they're classics for a reason. Yeah. To each their own personal appeal. We can respect that. Mm-hmm. Even if it's wrong. As much as they're wrong. Yeah. Oh, God. But Romeo and Juliet, I liked watching it um, much. M- when I tried, the more I watched it, or the more I read it, the more I liked it. But in high school, it's just the most basic play you could ever start someone off with Shakespeare. Yeah, my it's personal just... favorite was always Midsummer Night's Dream. Oh, beautiful! That's it's that yeah. remains one of my favorite rom coms of all time because no one gets hurt. Right? No one's insulted. Ever. And well, I mean, poor Helen. Honestly, she gets insulted consistently throughout that play. Well, I, yeah. But and she falls in, she falls in love with a spotted and inconstant dickhead. Yeah, but then he gets his his uh, his shit wrecked by the fay and he he gets set right. Yeah, that always kind of I always was a little unsettled by that because that that doesn't seem like real love to me. It's like a love potion. And so I know me? that was bait. I'm oh, sorry, go ahead. I know that is based on like uh, the myth of Cupid, and but it's also like Cupid and Psyche, the myth, the mythology behind that, how he was struck by one of his own arrows, and so he was put under a love spell. But here's the thing: love spell versus actual love relationship. That's where I'm drawing the line because that's not real love. That's a spell. That's forced love. You know to what I mean? To me, it felt less of a forced love and more of a hey. You mainly love this person mm-hmm. because of what her family can do for you. Yeah. All this spell is doing is taking away the allure of riches and letting you see the truth of what love is actually right in front of you. That's how I interpret it anyway. Hmm. But Okay, I can see that. But but it, it's it, it it is very easily done of like hey this is um her and as an adult you realize that the issue between um Tatiana uh, Titania and uh, Oberon was really just a custody battle. Yeah, it, it real, was just it's a really real life... bad divorce. Yep. <laughs> Oh 
god. It's like when your ex comes, such a comes in with like some sort of scumbag just to make you feel jealous, but you're like, but really though? <laughs> Look, divorce makes people do wild things, like make yeah. dating a jackass. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, let's let's get back on the subject. <laughs> <laughs> and right on track. Yeah. Okay, so there's a question I'd like to ask uh, my audience members. Um, what is one of the spiciest books you have ever read? Because this is like a spicy book uh, romance podcast. <sighs> what genre of spice we talking well, Akatar is a good introduction mm. to 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 smut, but mm -hmm. so far the spiciest author I have yet read, besides uh, uh, Scarlet Saint Clair for the T A Touch of Darkness series, that was just cringy as fuck. Mm. Uh, I'm sorry to the friend who recommended me that, <laughs> but uh, I recently started reading Jennifer Armentrout, and she puts Chapter Fifty Five of Mist and Fury to shame. Really? Yeah. Like it's my that that scene is mild in comparison to just one of the interactions in her book. Mm. <laughs> I will say then, just in terms of the How do we feel about dark spicy? Go ahead. One of the books I'm working on by the lovely Sine Hebert, mm -hmm. um, with uh, I'm I'm co-narrating with uh, Katrina, who is a fantastic narrator in her own right. Uh, mm -hmm. Beautiful work, fantastic voices. Uh, it's called The House of Whispers, and um, there's a scene in chapter in in the late '50s chapters that. Uh, uh, all I can say is that. Mm, uh, hmm. How much do I want to give away? Should we issue a spoiler alert? Spoiler warning. Mm hmm She gets tied up in the basement of a hospital in a assumed dead doctor's illegal laboratory where he performed inhumane experiments. She's blindfolded and has a knife traced across her body. Oh. And that's only the foreplay. Yikes. Yeah, it gets real spicy, real dark, real quick. It's intense, but it's not... In a weird way, it's not over the top. It's... It's sensual. It's consensual. It's... Is the writing good? Oh, God, yes. No, the writing is fan like the the ca the actual character, the main character um is struggling with all sorts of mental and psychological issues in terms of just uh, former addiction, mental fatigue, possible psychosis, and the entire book is a, is an exploration of her gradual unraveling and devolving into madness and it's written very well and very tastefully like we don't see any it's a bit of a slow burn at first but then it ramps up real quick okay yeah writing style is always a thing for me so it's like okay if the writing style is good maybe i can get into it like, but, like there are there yeah. are other named characters that you're like you start to get in like there there's a there's a a lizard man police investigator. There's a shamanistic bouncer. And there's a... I hate to call him a demon, but he's kind of... Yeah, there is a shape-shifting, illusion-casting demon with magical drugs. Why does this sound like a game of Call of Cthulhu? <laughs> it, it only enhances the game, honestly. <laughs> Okay, yeah, but that that is the spiciest project I have read slash worked on to date. I'm sure there will be more in the future. Mm. Okay then. 
Have you ever heard of The Dresden Files by Jim Butcher? Yes, I have. Have you ever read them? No, I have not. I highly recommend this series. It's actually, the, the audiobooks are narrated by the guy that plays Spike from Buffy the Vampire Slayer. No shit. Yeah. Who, who by the way, and I've mentioned this on another episode, uh, he's not actually British. He's American. I knew it. <laughs> no one with teeth that good can be British. <laughs> He plays them. He narrates it, and he plays the main character, Harry. Harry Dresden. He's uh. Isn't he like the one I, American wizard with a license to kill? Pretty much. Um, I've described the series as being like Harry Potter, but American and rated R. <laughs> yeah. Oh god, though it's such great dark humor. But one of my favorite characters um is a vampire named Thomas Wraith. And he's what's known as a white court vampire, and they feed off of, instead of blood, they feed off of uh, human life force. But um, there's... So, like, what, they'll, they'll suck years <clears throat> off of you? Well, mm, no, just uh, energy. Uh, but uh, they do it in an um, explicit way. Sometimes. They can, they can just absorb is, your energy. Is, 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 is what you're describing what I think? you're describing most of them so when he... you say what that mouth do mm. and they say oh baby i can suck out your soul they're not lying not the soul mm. but i still recommend the series but thomas is a sarcastic little diva and i fucking love him and what sarcastic little divas. That's what Tamlin you. is. <laughs> oh no, he's way better than Tamlin. Um, <laughs> I'm <backwards>. sorry. <laughs> but no, like he's actually he's a real sweetheart. He's like that um uh looks like a cinnamon roll, but could kill you, and he's back and forth between um uh looks like a kill you and is actually a cinnamon roll. He's the in between that. Aw, so basically yeah. he's just an amorphous. I'm adorable, but don't cross me or I will cut you. More like I'm sexy as fuck, but and don't cross me, I will kill you. Ah, nice. <laughs> but um no, one of my other favorite characters is literally Bob the Skull. Just a skull? He's a, a talking skull. Uh, the, uh, he's a spirit of a of a warlock trapped inside of a skull, and he's got his thing. Here's the thing: he's so dirty minded. He makes so the best innuendos in the entire series. And in order, and Harry he helps Harry out. He helps him out with certain spells or certain knowledges of the universe or the magical universes that they encounter. But in or in exchange for his services, he has a uh, one. Uh, maybe a couple of demands. One of them being that Harry read him smutty books. <laughs> I've heard of people throwing them a bone, but that's ridiculous. <laughs> I approve this pun. <laughs> but <don't. laughs> that and in the first book, uh, spoiler alert, in exchange for his services, he has Harry uh, make a, not a love potion, but a lust potion just for fun. My only question is, he's just a head, right? No other body or anything? Just a skull. A skull. He's a spirit trapped inside a skull. You have to read this book, okay? I do have to. Oh, God, I gotta, uh, I've got more to read. <laughs> Drop what you're reading right now. Go, go get but the I'm first book. But I'm for work. <laughs> Literally, I get paid to read. I, I love my job. That's fair. That's fair. But, okay, like, when you read the first I've... book, if oh, you sorry, read at least, yeah, read up to maybe book four, because book four actually includes uh, the uh, winter and summer court of Fae, like an actual altercation that Harry gets, you know, uh, strung into. But, mm hmm. But, uh, that actually reminds me of a. <laughs> yeah, first book is. Hold on. Uh... Yeah, go ahead. Let me make sure I have the. First book of the Dresden Files is called Stormfront, by the way. 
Stormfront. Gotcha. Mm-hmm. Ooh, that yeah. that actually reminds me of a book series that my my dad got me. It's it's a fay noir book set in Chicago in the 1920s. <gasps> That's perfect because this series is also set in Chicago. <gasps> no. Yeah. Oh, fuck. I you got to read these books. Got to read the books. <laughs> Uh, I, I swear to God, this author has some of the best dark humor. Okay, okay, okay. First book, I'm going to give you a little spoiler alert. So You're going to have to send end... me the list. Send me the list. But hold on one moment. I'll be right back. I got, I got to go find that okay. book so I can, I can tell you about it. I'll be right back. Okay. Found it. Sorry. All right. Ah, I'm so excited. Ah, I rarely get to talk to people about this series. Ah, it's so much fun. Okay. Let's it's hear it. called A Mick Oberon Job by Ari oh. Marmel. Mick Oberon? As uh, in? M I C K O B E R O N. As in Oberon from Midsummer Night's Dream? Yup. That's, <gasps> that's the last name that the character gave themselves. I love that. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. Okay. Uh, uh, do I uh, in like more about, or do you want do you want one of the blurbs? Both. So this is a blurb from book two, Hollow Point. Mick Oberon may look like just another 1930s private detective, but beneath the fedora and the overcoat, he's got pointy ears and he's packing a wand. The Spear of Lou is in Chicago, and everyone, everyone wants it for it is said that he who carries the spear into battle cannot be defeated. Those chasing it include an agent of the infamous Wild Hunt, a mobster who knows far more about these things than he should, and, of course, both the Seely and Unseely courts, the very last people P.I. Mick Oberon would want getting hold of the spear. Okay, this is actually sounding a lot like Harry Dresden, even down to the costume. I think it's... I, I think it's inspired by... But it's very much its own thing. I I do think you'll love it. Okay, yeah. I I I gotta look into this then. Ah, uh, book nerds. Yes. Yes. Okay. So, really great uh, dialogue of uh, just a great example of how sarcastic Harry is. So, in the very very first book, uh, spoiler alert: he's defeated the villain. And he's saved from a burning house by his warden. Now, the thing about Harry and his backstory is that he committed a magical crime when he was much younger, and he's been, like, on probation ever since. And he has a warden uh, named Morgan. Warden Morgan. Who, (laughs) yes. Morgan's actually a badass, but he's such a a hard ass. Um, He's ready to kill Harry at any point. And uh, Harry kind of recruits him to help on this... uh, on this assignment he's on, he defeats the villain, and uh, Morgan, like, pulls him out of the burning house, but Harry's unconscious, so he gives him CPR. He wakes up to find Morgan giving him the CPR, and then he kind of sits up, he looks around him, and (laughs) he sees the burning house, and he just bursts into some maniacal, ha-ha, I have defeated the villain laugh, and Morgan's just staring down at him like, uh... Are you okay? Is this then, so me kissing you makes you laugh hysterically? <laughs> Got it. Cool. <laughs> no, no, no. Harry says, "Just give me some Listerine and I'll be okay." <laughs> Listen, I would if I just saved your life and the only thing you say is "Give me Listerine," I'm slapping you full in the mouth. <laughs> like I'm sorry. Do you not appreciate the gift of life I have given you? <laughs> Get the fuck out of here. Oh, seriously, start the series as soon as you can, okay? I will do my best. Yeah. Uh, right. I, I am, however, like booked for the next five months since I have oh. like 10 audiobooks scheduled so far this year. Oh, good luck with that. Thank you. I'm going to need it. Yeah. All right. Here's where I'm going to close off the episode. And I would like to um, say a massive thank you again to Henry for joining me today. I almost called you Harry because we were talking about Harry dressed him. <laughs> It's not the first time someone said the wrong name about me. Sorry. 
This has been really, really fun. Uh, where can people find you on your social medias? Uh, you can find me on Facebook or Instagram at HW Kramer VO or on TikTok at HW Kramer. Awesome. Thank you to everyone who has joined us today. I hope you are all doing well and staying safe. And I hope you enjoyed this episode almost as much as the book you are currently reading. Until next time, have a wonderful day. Be safe. <laughs>